You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am really excited to have Owen Coffer back on the show with me today, and uh, we are going to talk about a new project that he has coming out uh, on Disney+, and uh, that's uh, near and dear to his heart, I'm sure, and uh, probably a, a very good portion of our listening audience as well. Uh, Artemis Fowl is coming to... Uh, to the big screen or, or to the the small screen uh, or screens all around you uh, very soon. Uh, welcome back to the show, Owen. Thank you. It's it's nice to be back. Um, it's nice to be anywhere, even virtually. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know we we were just chatting before we before we started, and man, has this been a weird past four months or so. This is uh, yeah. I, I think when when we talked last time. Um, your your new book had just come out, and uh, I, I don't think any of us, you know, saw this this coming. Um, you know, High Fire was yeah. uh, was out, and this book that's so much fun, uh, you know, dragons in in Louisiana, and I just I don't think any of us saw this coming. Did you? No, but I mean, I remember thinking then, wow, the world is crazy now. And nothing had happened. <laughs> you know, it was just the usual stuff. Uh, but now we're just gone to a whole new level. And I, I think because it's it's worldwide and international, we're all getting that feeling of being in the same boat together, which is uh, which in one way is kind of nice. It certainly has brought Irish people um, closer together in that we feel we're all pulling or rowing our boats in the same direction as such. So that's been the only upside, I suppose. Well, as a creative person, and I've I've had some conversations with people, um, kind of all over the spectrum. Um, you know, writers are an interesting lot in that um, we we wind up spending a lot of our time uh, at home or in our home offices, uh, looking at a computer screen, and so in one respect, the um, the the pandemic the shutdown that's happened all over the world uh, should not have affected writers a whole lot um, we're we're kind of still doing what we've what we've always done uh, but there is a, a a mental aspect to what's going on um, how has all of this stuff uh, affected you and your creative process it hasn't been so hard on me I'm I think I'm very lucky in that I'm in the more fortunate bracket of people who are isolated in that um, I can go to a room on my own. I have an office in the garden um, and also my kids are older. Uh, they're 22 and 17. So they don't need looking after. And in fact, they don't want looking after and they don't get up until midday and I go to bed at 1030. So it's a very minimal crossover time. So what that means is really I've been able to work as usual. Uh, and if anything, I've gotten to spend a little more time with our kids because we all have dinner together now every day. And, and and that's been really nice. But I know talking to my friends who have younger kids who are maybe who don't have who don't have the luxury of an office uh, like I do. I'm very fortunate that way. There is a kind of a malaise setting in. They find it difficult just to find the headspace to do some work. And then a lot of writers tend to get lost in their own thoughts. And maybe these days the thoughts aren't uh very conducive to work so i think i've been lucky so far but there are days like everybody else i get up and i feel a little bit down but most days um i have been working as usual and sometimes even more so more than usual so i really i really can't complain though i do i complain constantly but i shouldn't i shouldn't complain <laughs> Well, the last time we talked, um, your book High Fire was just coming out, and it was really a, a departure for you yeah. um, in a lot of ways. Um, how how has that book 
um, you know, getting some hindsight on it now. Um, and, yeah. um, how did that help to, to stretch you and, and grow you as a creative person after, you know, coming off of the, um, the Artemis Fowl series, um, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but that was, that was, you know, a, a hugely influential series, uh, you know, as a writer to, to kind of wash your hands of that figuratively and turn your attention to a, a project that was so completely different. Um, you know, what did that do for you as a creative person to get to do something so different? It was a real episode in closure for me. I, I had done after Artemis Fowl, I did another trilogy for young people. Um, and I just felt it wasn't a complete break. And also, so I felt I had one foot still in the Artemis Fowl camp. So I wanted just to do a complete something so different that at no time could anyone reading it link it back to the Artemis Fowl stuff. So I, I thought of the craziest thing I could think of, which was a, a talking dragon living in Louisiana and just did a, I don't know, a rambunctious, uh, rip roaring modern day fable about it and it, it was very cathartic in a way it was a lot of fun uh it was a lot of uh there was a lot of uh joy to be had writing it and hopefully reading it and and it just kind of put a full stop on the artemis file stuff and for me also it, it let me go back into it because it did it showed me oh i can write a fantasy book for adults and get published so there's no need to worry about that. You know, I can do that if I need to do it. And uh, so I don't feel under pressure to prove anything in that particular arena anymore. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It, it was received well received. I had great crowds around uh, the States. I, I think when I talked to you, I, I, I was either just going or coming back from an American tour. So uh, and I just had the best time. And what was really nice is a lot of the Artemis Fowl readers showed up um, and now they're grown, so they they would have read the last book they read of mine maybe when they were twelve, and now they're thirty five, mm -hmm. and they possibly have kids themselves. So it was a really uh, it was a nice experience. I, I, I hope to go back to Vern and High Fire at some point and do another one, but at the moment <coughs> um, I am just experimenting and looking for different stuff to do and. The nice thing about Artemis Fowl is that it gives you that uh, bedrock. So I can take six months and go and write a play or um, maybe make a short film with someone I'm, I, that I admire. It, it's just been great. And I, another nice thing is I can call people up. And because of Artemis Fowl, they'll probably take that call, um, which is really nice. Now, usually nothing happens, but at least um, you get the call. So I have Artemis to thank for that. <laughs> That's it. Mm. Artemis is a pretty good door opener, isn't he? Yeah, it's a great calling card um, so far. So hopefully that will that will you know that will extend on for the next few years. Well, uh, when we talked last, we knew there was some Artemis foul news coming, um, but uh, but it hadn't really been announced to the world yet. So there there was not a lot that we could talk about. Um, no. And it just recently, there's been some enormous news uh, that's come out, and um, you know, to 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 my surprise, um, it's coming out next week on on Disney Plus, yeah. and I was like, "What? Th this is this is insane." Um, refresh our listeners, if you would. When did you start writing Artemis Fowl, and were you teaching school at the time that that uh, Artemis came into your life? Yeah, I was teaching uh, middle grade in uh, Wexford in Ireland, and uh, in the evenings then I was writing the Artemis Fowl book, which you, which was my seventh book, uh, and I didn't realize that I had anything um, with international potential on my hands uh, uh, until my wife read it, and she's always my first reader, and, and she just said, right, you need to get an agent now. Um, because I had never bothered getting an agent. I, I felt I didn't need an agent. I had a publisher, but she was, uh, she was right. And I got an agent very quickly, which was another sign that there was something about Artemis that was a little different. And, and then within two or three months, um, my agent had got a movie deal for Artemis 
um, even before a publisher. So it, it was very, uh, it just took off like a rocket. Uh, and uh, they they said, well, we're going to start making the movie in the next couple of months. And I believe that. And obviously that didn't happen because here we are 20 years later and, and the movie is still not out. And it seemed that it was destined to just be faced with one obstacle after another, after another. And there was a series of um, directors who were hired and then had to be let go and there was a series of producers who switched in and out and and then the two movie companies that, that were making it disney and uh, the weinstein company they fell apart um and then 10 years later they got back together and then of course there was the horrible situation with harvey weinstein which is ongoing and uh so it just seemed as if it was never going to happen. And actually there are other writers that I know who, whose projects are still lost in that particular box of files. So Artemis was the only one to get out of it. And uh, I suppose they probably despair. I think they're starting to surface now, but it's been, they've been in there for 20 years, same as me. And, uh, and then it was made into a movie, which was supposed to come out summer 2019. And then Disney bought Fox, so the schedule was scrapped. And then it was coming out in June 2020, or sorry, May 2020, last month. Uh, and then uh, COVID-19 came along. And so it was, that date was scrapped. And as soon as that happened, I started sending emails to anyone I had connections to suggesting that it should go on Disney Plus because I thought it would be a great platform for it. And I thought that kids would really appreciate a new movie while they're shut in their houses. And also I felt because it's not a known uh, IP, as they say, like the Avengers or, you know, Batman, that it would be two years before it would be put out. And even then it might go on to Disney Plus. So I thought it would be better to go now while we're still, it would be the first one. Uh, so I don't know if my emails were ever read. I imagine they weren't. But the people at Disney reached that conclusion themselves. And uh, so I got a call a couple of weeks ago to say, yeah, we're going out on Disney Plus and we're going out on June 12th. So after all this time, it's actually it's a whirlwind now. So uh, it's just the movie business is just uh, it's on in a world of its own. And they obey different rules. there. certainly not the rules of mere mortals like ourselves. <laughs> But, but it's good. I think it's actually great because I don't have to. Uh, I think this, there won't be so much scrutiny. There won't be so much travel involved. It'll be very gentle on me and the family and it'll just be out and everybody can watch it whenever they like. So uh, and as many times as they like. So um, I think it's a very nice way. And all the people who I know that are, par are parents, they're thrilled because the kids are just uh, just looking for something new to watch. You would think there would be like, plenty of stuff on Disney to watch, but they want something new, you know, that it's not nostalgic, it's a new thing. So hopefully that will that will help it get those all important views. Well, um, I have five kids that... Uh, and, what? And, yes, and three of them uh, have moved out of the house. They're, they're old and... Um, you know, college age or and and beyond, and uh, what my oldest son is a is an English teacher, um, oh. as has taught for a couple of years now. But they are all coming home to my house next week as we watch Artemis Fowl on Disney Plus. Um, I'm I'm so excited for this. <laughs> are, are you happy about that? I don't know. Or are you are you looking forward to that? Or are you anxious? I hope you're that they're all coming back to the house because it's probably nice and tidy in your house now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, a, a little of all of the above. Yeah. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. 
Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world-building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors. Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. Um, but you know, you bring up a great point um, because I think a lot of writers would, you know, look forward to the day when a movie studio takes notice of their little book that that has an an audience of its own, and uh, it it really, um, you know, when when a book becomes a movie, um, a lot of times that that's a springboard to a larger larger audience, and lots of good things happen. Um, there, but but that road, as you so deftly illustrated, um, has a lot of potholes in it. A lot of times, it's not as simple as you know. We think of writing a book; it's it's a very solitary process for ninety five percent of the process. It's it's you in your office writing the book. Then the thing is completed, and you share that with an editor, and you go back and forth a few times, and uh, and you know it goes to the publisher, and they're there, there's only a handful of people involved in the entire process. Movie yeah. making, as you've illustrated, is a 20-year process sometimes with loads and loads and loads of people involved in it. Um, yeah. Does it ever feel like, as the writer, as the creator of this IP, of this great character in this world, does it ever feel like that the world and the character have just gotten away from you and it's now a completely different thing than you first intended? It, it feels like that all the time. I mean, from the, the first day, it feels like that. But you have to ac- accept that uh, and you have to make peace with that early because if you take the choice to accept that check, then you have to also accept that they are, the movie people are going to make it into a movie. And it, a movie is not a book. And there are great adaptations. Um like the Princess Bride, or uh, I don't know, there's so many of them now, really good ones, and there is bad ones also, and you have to take your chances there. I mean, I was very lucky in that uh, Kenneth Branagh got it, and he has people like Josh Gad and Judy Dench in there. So I'm pre- feeling pretty good at the moment that it's people are going to like it, but it could easily have gone the other way. But I've made peace with it a long time ago. It's been 20 years uh and the choice I had to make was, OK, if I take this movie option, what that means literally is that I can be a full time writer um, for five years. I can give it a try for five years. And not only that, I can put an office in the garden and I can work in my office uh, as a writer for at least five years. And that was I have to say that was pretty much irresistible and uh my, I also thought there's a 90%, 95% chance that this movie won't be made anyway. Uh, and so I would be crazy not to to take that. And I mean, up to, up to a couple of years ago, I was pretty sure that my bet had paid off and the movie was not going to be made. Uh, and I still have my lovely office. But now that they are making it, or that they have made it, I, I, I feel that my numbers come up and I was very lucky because it could have gone very badly. And, and instead of that, it's gone really well. So uh, I'm feeling pretty happy right now. I mean, I know it's going to come out and that people won't like bits or they will like bits or they'll think it's different to the book. But uh, it is different. Of course, it's different. But I would hope that people will be as relaxed as me <laughs> because I'm quite relaxed. I would go in and, 
And if I if I think the change is a good change, uh, that maybe it wouldn't have worked in a book, but it works in a movie, then that's great because I, I don't want to see a direct transcription uh, of what I've done. I want to be surprised and see something new and something interesting. That That's a really great um, attitude to have about it because no matter how – how much of a fan the the filmmakers are of the book it, it's going to change it's a different medium it's uh you know now we've seen some uh, adaptations that are pretty faithful to the original material some of it uh it it feels like that the books were just a jumping off point and and yeah. the, you know the, the creators just went in completely different directions and and as a fan of the book, sometimes that stings a little, um, you yeah. know, when you when you feel like someone has taken something that you care so, so deeply for and, and just did something completely different. Um, but a, as the creator, um, not just the writer of the books, but the, the creator of the world and the characters and, you know, so much that you dreamed up of. Um, that that are, are now in the books. Do you do you get any input to the movie making process? Um, I I think I could have had more than I did, but I I try to stay away from it. Um, I did I visited the set a few times. We had a few chats about the script and the characters. You know what Kenneth Branagh's understanding of the character was versus what I thought, and we we were pretty aligned. And once I realized that he had the best of intentions, um, I, I pretty much left them to it because I, I don't feel I have much to offer to a movie. I, I, I've never written a movie script. Um, I don't know really. I've never, I don't know what the three act structure is uh, other than I've heard of it. So there wasn't really much point of me being in that room. Not that I was asked to be in that room specifically, but I really don't like being anywhere that I'm not needed and in the publishing world, it often happens that you're asked to go to stuff just so you can be there. And I don't really like to do that. I I don't travel to many openings or launches or film premieres. I tend to stay at home because it's not necessary for me to be there. And there's something I, something else I can be doing. So it's the same with this. Once I realized it was in good hands, I kind of left them to it. And every now and then they would send me a draft of a script or they would send me artwork or design work or maybe little videos to make sure that the characters were, were how I liked them. Now, if I had said, no, that guy is not how I like it, change everything, that probably wouldn't have happened. But they were just were uh, they were very courteous and respectful, which, which I really appreciated. And uh, they were very nice to my family, which is very important. So whatever happens with this movie, I think for me, the actual making part has been a very nice experience and something that uh i mean i don't forget when people are nice to my family i kind of tend to remember that and and i certainly will remember that about disney absolutely um how long ago was was this movie actually filmed uh when would did the 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 main photography happen and then you know all of the behind the scenes special effects are added after the fact how how long has this movie been in in actual production it's about, I think it's over two years. I first met Ken, Kenneth Branagh four years ago, and then he had a year in theatre. And while he was doing that, he was also casting and designing. So after, so I'd say two, I'd say it's about two and a half years ago when they filmed it. And that took about eight months. It was a long shoot. Uh, and then it was supposed to be, it would have been just about ready um, for last uh, May, May twenty. 2019 um but as it turned out then when the date was shifted they took advantage of the extra months um to work on the special effects uh and to actually make more special effects uh so they say it would have been ready by 2019 may but i think they were glad to have that extra year what's funny to think about is uh you know 20 years ago we're, we're talking about the year 2000 and there were some some great movies that were coming out then. Um, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings uh, yeah. series was, was coming out then. Uh, Harry Potter, uh, you know, was, was really starting his uh, film journey during that time. Um, both of those, um, both of those uh, franchises, if you look back at those first movies, while they both hold up very well, 
they're starting to show some some of the cracks of the uh the special effects and 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 things like that um you know it it's got to be uh while you know Artemis Fowl has had a 20 year journey to the screen um it it's kind of great that those movies are being made now because the technology that we have so much more technology now than we had 20 years ago um you have to think that uh, if Artemis would have made his big screen debut 20 years ago those movies would be very different than than what we have now. Absolutely. I mean, I love the Lord of the Rings movies especially, but when I do look back at them, there are some points where you have to put on your rose-colored spectacles and just pretend that, especially when they put the orcs, or not the orcs, when they put the the hobbits and the elves together in the same room and uh, everyone is adjusted for size, it, it does look a little bit uh, ropey now, but... I think you can ignore that pretty much like you can ignore the Harryhausen monster effects um, from the, the the Greek movies. It's it's all of its day, but definitely uh, the Artemis effects are really uh, fantastic now. And you, there's no you can't see the join as I say. Everything looks absolutely real and fantastic, and uh, even the computer generated figures is a couple. They look, they look, they look brilliant. So I'm, yeah, I couldn't be more pleased uh, with with the effects work. And it, it's, yeah, in when you're looking for positives in a 20 year wait, that would be one of them. That it does absolutely look a lot better as a movie. And I think it will uh, open the books out to to a whole a whole new generation, not just people kids who are a few years older but we're we're talking kids whose parents read the book and even their grandparents so uh yeah it's going to open it up and and i would love that all i love the idea that these people who read the book back in 2001 can revisit it now as as nostalgia almost or can watch the movie as nostalgia and then to their kids it's a whole new thing so hopefully it's hitting people at every level well, and and opening a book series to new readers is is never a bad thing. That that is something that we all dream of and aspire to. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's. I mean, it's great that it's getting a a new breath of uh, life, and it's already started. It just even since the first trailer came out, um, my the, I can tell because my the crowds of my readings are just uh, much bigger uh, than they used to be for the past two years. They're back up to the the levels that of 2005 and 2006 when the, the series w- was at its its zenith so it, that's really nice and it, very gratifying for me that has to be so exciting um yeah, yeah I mean. as a writer sitting alone at your desk and creating this world and creating these characters there there have to be scenes that you wrote that uh that excited you and uh meant a lot to you as a uh, as a consumer of the movie now, watching your creation on the screen, was there a, a particular scene uh, that just got you really excited to see how someone else interpreted and to see this thing that you created come to life on the screen? Yeah, I mean, I think when we meet Artemis for the first time, or when he puts on the suit, he he has a kind of a, he wears his Reservoir Dogs kind of suit. And uh, when he puts that on for the first time, that's a great moment. Um when we see the character, we, we get a, a glimpse of the the criminal mastermind that he's going to become very shortly. And I suppose the first outward sign of that is when he takes off the kid's clothes and puts on this uh, suit, which will become his trademark. And Ferdia, who plays Artemis, is such a great actor um, that he, he just takes it all in the stride. And you'd never know this was his first uh, major role. And Lara, who plays Holly... Um, she's just an amazing young actor. So to see those two, there's a great scene in, in the book <clears throat> when uh, Holly punches Artemis straight in the face, and it's uh, it's. I was interested to see how they would play that off, but they played it in a very humorous way. So it's not much of a punch, really. It's more for shock value than pain. But uh, they, yeah, that works really well. So yeah, there's a little, and there's a big troll fight towards the end. Which I was, I did, I was worried about that because again, the troll would have to be uh, a computer-generated troll. So I thought it might look a bit flat. Even, because even with modern effects, sometimes uh, it, these computer battles can look a bit flat. Uh, but it looks great, so I was very relieved, and it's become one of the high points of the movie now. 
you know, there's uh, when you when you watch a good movie that that's well produced, well directed, the the effects are great, and the story is just top notch. You know, as a creative person, you come away from that uh, energized and ready to uh, to tell a story of your own. That there's something about seeing seeing it done well that just just makes you excited to create for yourself. Um, seeing your creation interpreted like this and up on the screen does this get you excited to create again yeah and i i feel like that with books as well if i'm reading a particularly good book and i can really appreciate the way it's put together uh, i i have to stop all the time and just go and do something creative um and i think that's born out of uh, admiration for the work and um it's the same if i'm watching a movie and it, it's terrible for my wife because we watch tv together for watching a series I will be saying, oh, I love the way, you know, that paid off. They, I said this, that was set up in episode one, honey. And now they, they wait till episode five for the payoff. That was really well done. Um, and I'm always telling her who's the murderer because, you know, I know the formula. So it's terrible watching TV with me. But I, when I see something that I really like, um, it does make me just want to go away and, and try and work harder and be better. Well, we know that uh, that Disney Plus is debuting the movie. Um, we will have a link to it in the show notes of this episode, obviously, and to the book series where people can go. Because I know when they watch this movie, they're going to get excited and want to dig into the books if they haven't yet. Um, but what's what's occupying your desk these days? Well, I'm doing. A, I've got a couple of projects on the go. I just finished the second. Bal Twins book, which is about Artemis' little brother. It's, it's probably going to be a trilogy, and I'll leave it at that. And uh, I'm also uh, doing some work on a musical, kind of a jukebox musical uh, about 1970s glam rockers. So we're getting all the rights together for a lot of s songs from the mid-70s, which has been fun. Uh, so hopefully when the theatres open up again, we'll be ready to go in with our show. So... Uh, I'm immersed in the music of Mark Bolan and David Bowie at the moment, so that's a nice place. If you have to be in solitude, that's a nice place. That's some nice company to have. That sure is. That absolutely is. Um, Owen, thank you so much for taking time of you, out of your very busy schedule to talk a little bit about uh, Artemis Fowl with me today. We're going to put links to it, as I said, in the show notes of this episode, and we'll uh, hopefully send some readers to... Uh, uh, your way as well. Fantastic. I appreciate it. It was great to talk to you again. Um, I think our schedule is every four months now. I, I so think I'll, it is. I'll, yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll touch base again in the fall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. Thank you. Bye-bye.